one, first of all, thanks for tuning in for the first week. That was awesome. Great turnout. Uh, a lot of great things being discussed. I hope that you guys got something out of it. I know I got a lot out of it as far as notes wise and just I'm learning some different perspectives, some different ideas and some different things that I'm going to use next year. And even in the fall with different athletes that we get to work with once we get back in person and everything gets going that way. So that was really cool to see. It was really fun and it's awesome to hear you guys' feedback. So when you do have feedback or you have something that you want to add in, please use the chat, um, unmute and just let it rip. Um, we're always open to learning more. And I think if the whole group can benefit, then that's the real win. If we can all benefit from this, we're all in charge of a lot of different athletes in a lot of different areas from the West Coast to the East Coast and in between. If we can continue to make that impact and continue to learn and grow in our crafts, we're going to impact the next generation, develop more leaders and, and truly make our stamp um, on this world. So that's going to be huge. So I love it. But this week we're talking offense. And this is my favorite category because – we all like to bop it, right? We all want to bop it. We all want to drive in runs. We all want to have a high scoring offense. So we're going to talk a little bit about how to create a high scoring offense as far as a team and some different things and different strategies that either some of us have used or, or have been a part of in our careers. And I think it's, it's like I said, it's my favorite subject. I love offense. And this is an awesome, awesome opportunity to just get something out of this, hopefully that we can use with our athletes as well. So I'm going to kind of kick it off as far as approach goes and some things that have worked for some of the teams that I've been a part of and then kind of what I wanted to Im implement with my athletes that I get to work with and, and so on. So for me, it's all about what are we swinging at? Like it all starts with what are we swinging at? You get a lot of hitters that come in, whether you work with individuals or you work with groups and teams, they're always like, coach, what's wrong with my swing? They always want, they always want the quick fix mechanically. And we'll get into that tomorrow. Um, we got a lot of guys who are really good on that end, but most of it starts with our mind. If we walk up to the plate with the best mechanics in the world, that's great. We're giving ourselves a good opportunity to win and succeed. But if our mind is not right, we're not going to be successful. And that starts with having an approach. So for hitters, as far as a team-wise, it's what are we looking to swing at? So I like to empower my hitters to think about what is your favorite pitch to hit? There's no real cookie-cutter answer, and you can do it multiple ways. Maybe you have a team approach as we're going to hunt fastballs early in the count. We're going to get ahead of, of, the, of the pitchers and jump them a little early. Um, maybe we have a good scouting report if we're at a higher level. If we're in college, maybe we have a scouting report on a guy, and we have a little more access. But most of us are high school or youth coaches to where we don't usually have that luxury of having a scouting report, having this velo, having what pitches he throws and what counts and all that good stuff. It's I see a guy with an arm, and he's right-handed, and he's throwing a fastball and a changeup and a curveball, and now we've got to get ready to hit. So creating that team offense is really just having an approach and it's empowering your athletes specifically and individually to have a, an approach that's specific to them. So maybe for, like in my instance, I love the middle away heater. We're always jumping heaters and we got to be ready for the fastball. If we're not ready for the fastball, we're not going to be successful. Just bottom line on that. We've got to be hunting heaters. You ask some kids, hey, what are you looking for? I'm looking for a curveball up in the zone. I'm like, well, why, why, why? Why are you looking for a curveball up in the zone 0-0 oh, oh, or 1-0 oh, or 2-0? Oh. Look for your heater. Like, let's be on fastball timing more consistently to set ourselves up for success. But for me, I'm looking middle away heater because I know for my swing, I don't hit the inside pitch very well. I'm not going to be successful if I'm getting the inside pitch and trying to swing at it. But if I get the middle away fastball, I'm going to be able to drive that pitch more consistently to set me up for success on a more consistent basis. So empowering our athletes to develop their own approaches is going to be crucial. And it, get back, it gets back to week one about building that trust and that buy-in and that offensive strategy and philosophy. Well, it all starts with, hey, I trust you to swing at your pitches. If you had to go into a home run derby and you had five swings against Aaron Judge and Mike Trout, what pitch are you going to swing at? Is it a fastball down the middle? Is it middle in, middle away? What pitch is that? And now I want you to think about, and your hitters counts to be attacking those fastballs because you're going to set yourself up for success more often. And Jake's got a really cool description as far as six balls on the plate, being able to give us a good visual for that in a minute. But it's really empowering them to, to hunt their pitches. Because if you've got a group of nine or 15 or however many athletes you have to swing at their pitch, you're going to be very, very dangerous on offense. Just to give you a quick story at Nevada, we were going, I was actually, we were reminiscing this morning about our 2015 season and we had eight out of the nine athletes were over 320 batting averages. Um, we scored, I don't even know how many runs, set a ton of records offensively. And it was all started from our mindset. Nothing really changed physically. We shortened up a little bit. We had a good two strike approach, which we'll get into in a little bit, but it was more about our mental. Like what are we actually looking for at the plate and what are we going to hunt as hitters? And this goes from any level. Like, what are we going to hunt as hitters? We were aggressive on fastballs. 
and we focused on getting on time. So I asked my hitters two things, three things. One, did I swing in my pitch? Yes or no? Yes, good, no, okay, we understand. Two, was I on time? Yes or no? Pretty simple. And then three, what was the result? We never chase the result, but the result is usually a byproduct of number one, what, like, did I swing in my pitch? Number two, was I on time? So if we can simplify the game to that, instead of all this craziness that's just flooding our minds at the plate and that throws this, this, and this, and I don't know what to do, I don't know what to look for, we're going to be more successful. So I think just creating that philosophy from an early, early standpoint in the fall um, or whenever you get your athletes together is going to be huge to develop that successful offensive philosophy. Jake, I want to get into the, the balls on the plate because I think this is important to create a visual. And if you talk about a drill to do for this, how do you train this? Well, this is an easy way. Put the balls on the plate. You can color them. You can do different things, get creative. But put the balls on the plate in your zone. We used to do it in BP where we would put one ball on the plate on the pitch that I hit the best. So I put it middle away. Boom. I'm going to crank that pitch. And that's what I'm focusing on. That's the pitch that I'm trying to hit. Yes, I might swing in a ball middle end. I might swing in a ball a little off the plate. But – my focus is on that pitch middle away because it's going to set me up for success. And the last thing I've got before I dish it off, Jake, is we asked Paul Goldschmidt, what are you looking for at the dish? Like, what is your mindset? What is your approach? And we're thinking, like, it's going to be this extensive approach, like this crazy thing. He goes, I'm looking for a fastball right down the middle. And I about fell out of my chair. I'm sitting there like, wait, what are you talking about? Fastball right down the middle? That's it? Like, that simple? It's like, yes, I'm looking for a heater down the middle. Because if I'm on time for a heater down the middle, I give myself the best time to hit the mistakes or best chance to hit mistakes and the best opportunity to get on time for my fastball. And we're just blown away like, wow, I'm looking for all these different things, looking to try and drive the ball, but you're just looking for a heater down the middle with an intent to do damage. I loved it. It fired me up. Jake, I want to kick it off to you about the balls on the plate because I think this is important. Yes, and this does two things. So this breaks down a whole bunch of different hitting drills that you can do. Um, and I'll use the different language that we use for like younger age teams and then older age teams. Um, but the second thing that it does is exactly that. It teaches you as a coach and your team um, a specific hitting approach language that allows you to use that in game. Okay. I think one of our biggest issues when we talk approach as a coach is when you get into a game, it's really, really easy to critique physical mechanics while they hit, but that doesn't help them at all because they can't switch it that quickly in the middle of a game um, to get the result that they want. So we have to do a good job as coaches when we're coaching the bases of talking approach to them while they hit rather than talking mechanics. Um, and this is just kind of an outline of the language that you can use with them um, once it's introduced to the team. So I don't have a plate down here, but the plate is exactly six baseballs across. So this is the exact width of the plate. Okay. If you're a righty or a lefty, no matter which side you're on, your inside corner is zone one. So if I'm a right-handed hitter, we go zone one, two, three, four, five, six. If I'm a left-handed hitter, we go zones one, two, three, four, five, six. So always from inside to outside, okay? The first step, and you'll find it's actually kind of funny to do this with players, um, we just call it zone recognition. So when you're throwing front toss or BP, when they take a swing and hit it, um, have them call out what zone it's in. Have them tell you where it crossed the plate. Um, we typically have our on deck hitter either behind the L screen or if you're in an indoor facility behind the cage um, and they're calling out the zone that it actually crossed. Okay. So if I'm a hitter, I swing, I say one. Um, if Adam's on deck and realizes I'm wrong, he can say, no, it's a three. That way I get instantaneous feedback in regards to if I'm actually calling the right zones. Um, and it really helps hitters actually get an understanding of the plate because a lot, a lot of times what they think is an inside pitch is actually down the middle. So you get a lot of hitters that say that they kill the inside pitch, but the reality is they can't touch it if it's actually on the inside. Okay. So that's the first step is understand your zones, be able to call them out and just increase your plate discipline and recognition. And then from there in a hitter's count, we break it down into three approaches. Okay. So for age groups 12 and up, we number the zones for 11 and under, we break it down to where these two, we would just call it in middle, and out, right? So if there's an eight-year-old kid or a nine-year-old kid and you think that six zones is too much for them, they're going to struggle with that, then you can lump them together and still get the same mindset um, until we get a little bit upper level of like cutting one zone in certain counts. So for the younger age groups, it helps to split it that way. All right. So when we break down approach, we, we have three different options. The first one is middle in. 
So we take the two outside zones and we don't want to swing at them. We're going to take any pitch in this area because we're going to shrink our focus so that we can do damage and be on time if it's in the spot that we're in. Okay, the second approach would be the exact opposite where we look middle away. Okay, or sorry, yeah, where we look middle away. So we're cutting the two inside, but we're looking to drive a ball from zone three all the way to zone six. Okay, I would say that those are the two easiest to implement. Okay, as soon as you do this third one, which is cutting the corners, so you're looking for something over the middle, um, it works. The issue is players now have to differentiate one ball on each side of the plate. So it's not as lumped together for them. Um, so we see a lot of like younger hitters struggle cutting the corners compared to the others. So this would be the third and final one that I would teach, um, but I would save it for more upper age teams. Okay. So breaking down real quick, like when to use each one, each hitter will naturally be really good at one. Okay. That's a great approach to have when they enter a game. But the second piece is every pitcher is going to do something different. So if we're cutting corners, cutting the one and cutting the six, we primarily use this approach against high velo pitchers that lack command. Okay. Because umpires, if someone's not hitting corners consistently, they typically aren't going to get that call when they suddenly paint it outside. Okay. So we use this approach against high velo guys that struggle with command because what we want to drive up their pitch count quick and get them out of the game. So we're going to cut corners. Okay. When we look middle away, we typically do this against low velo guys, okay, that consistently work away. Or you'll play a lot of teams that the coach is just fastball <coughs> away, change up away. Everything is away. So we do this one, okay, and we have our guys move a little bit closer to the plate to still be able to drive these. But what it does, our job on offense is to be proactive. So this, when we implement an approach like this, it tells the pitcher, hey, you're really good at throwing it here, but now I'm really good at hitting it here. So they're going to have to do something that they're uncomfortable with and challenge you in, okay? And most of the time, if we can make pitchers do something that they don't like to do, they're not going to be nearly as effective when they try to do it, okay? The third one, um, and we don't use this one very much, but middle in um, would be just somebody's like natural approach until you get to know the hitter. There's not a lot of pitchers out there that are going to straight up challenge you inside over and over. Um, so if you use this one, a lot of times what happens is you end up just falling down in the count over and over because they're working away and you've made the decision to take away. Okay. So I would only use that one. If you don't really have any scouting on the pitcher, you don't know what they do and you're just trying to hunt a heater in your zone until throughout the game, you get that information. All right. So those are the main three. I'm going to let Adam go a little bit more in depth. I'm sure I missed some things, but um, any questions that you guys have over those, some of the drills that we use when we break those down, um, feel free to ask. We'll have a few minutes in here to talk through some of that stuff too. But that's the basis of why we do what we do and how we break down approach and language to it. Yeah, and, and what I love about this the most is that it helps give hitters uh, an understanding of what their personal identity is. They see all kinds of other players um, around the world or, uh, that they play against on TV that they want to try to emulate. But they have to understand that their swing is their swing, and they can try to pick up different pieces of everybody else's, but they are their own hitter. Uh, the way that we explain this to our athletes to help them understand the how and the why is we give them an understanding that the plate is 17 inches across. And no matter how good of a hitter you are, how good of a hitter anybody is, nobody can cover all 17 inches of the plate as successfully as uh, 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 six, uh, with equal success throughout. So I, I said this before, um, I'm a Cub fan, but I think Albert Pujols is the greatest of all time as far as covering from one side of the plate to the, to the other side of the plate. But even Albert Pujols, could not cover the entire play with the same success rate. There were some parts of the play that he hit better and other parts of the play that he did not hit as well. And what we do with our players is we set these, these zones up, we throw pitches to them, and they quickly start to recognize that the pitches they're struggling to hit on a regular basis in a game, they're, they're realizing where those zones are, and they're seeing the ones that they're hitting really, really well. And it helps us allow them to understand uh, the idea of going into an at-bat with a plan as opposed to just going up there and hoping to get a hit. It puts them in a better situation for more likely to have success and overall just harder contact throughout. So we explain it to them and give them an idea that they need to have an approach when they go up there. So a lot of times we'll ask kids, hey, what did you bat last year? And just to keep it simple, we'll say a player batted 300 last year. And they had 100 at-bats, which means 70 times they got, they got out. 
So we always ask athletes, how many times out of those 70 at bats did you get yourself out because you had a bad approach because you were going up there swinging at pitches that you're not good at hitting. And a lot of them will say 20 and we say, okay, well imagine that you got out of those 20 times you got yourself out because you swung at bad pitches. You go up there with a better approach and now you get 10 extra hits out of those 70 times you got out. Now we've increased that, that hitter's batting average 100 points from 300 to 400, and we haven't even touched their mechanics yet, only because we're getting them to understand that they need to lay off certain pitches until they have two strikes and focus on other pitches um, or other locations uh, be before two strikes and focus on trying to hit those, and hopefully they're going to get that harder contact and get, and get better results out of that. So. When you're, if you're trying to implement this, that's the understanding why and try to explain it to your players as, hey, there's some pitches we're just going to flat out not swing at until we ha absolutely have to. And that absolutely have to is two strikes. We can adjust those three um, uh, approaches that Jake talked about based on where the hitter, the, the pitcher's pitching. If the pitcher's just a consistent, you know, uh, throw it on the outside corner um, and he's hitting his spots, we can't just as a team say, hey, we're, uh, middle in hitters and we're just not going to swing at that if he's hitting his spots we got to adjust so we got to move up to the plate try to turn the outside corner and down the middle and it helps you give an overall individual idea identity to players but implementing a team approach that everybody understands going into the at bat and going into the uh the entire game against certain pitchers yeah i really enjoy that i really like the fact of a hey, let's Let's adjust our game plan a little bit. Yeah, we've got one game plan, and this is what we're going to do going into the game. But maybe in the game, that pitcher is doing something completely different or different from what you actually thought they were going to do. And now we've got to adjust, right? Like we've got to be versatile and be able to, hey, let's, let's start hunting this. This is where he's given us. Let's, let's hunt this pitch. Maybe he's on that day. And there's some co college coaches in here, some high-level high school. Like, who knows what happens in some of these situations. But guess what? Like, if we can give ourselves the best opportunity to win – we're going to have more wins. And I like the fact that you said, hey, let's, we haven't even touched his, his mechanics yet. We just switched, hey, what are we looking for at the dish? Getting a, a, an athlete to understand plate coverage is just the first and, and foremost, one of the greatest things you can possibly do for an athlete. And that can start at an early age because at an early age, we're swinging the balls over our head, balls that are at us, because we just want to get in the cage and hit. And I encourage you in practice, especially, and Ronnie, you can get into the cage side of things here in a minute, but in practice, especially like, Instead of just getting up there and swinging at everything, let's be focused. Let's put the balls on the plate so we can see what we want to hit. Or let's say, hey, for this round of BP, you're going to swing at your pitch. And if you don't swing at your pitch, if you swing at balls outside of your zone consistently, you're out, you're out, like you're done. We're going to yank it because if we're not going to commit to it, then there's no reason to have you in there. And I remember just some of our athletes got so frustrated in BP because they kept swinging at balls in and they kept, you kept seeing the results pop up to shortstop, pop up to first base, miss even. But then you get the ball in their zone, and it's laser to right center, laser to left center, laser up the middle off the L screen. And it's like, wow, I didn't have to tell you, hey, shorten up or, hey, um, drive your back hip to the ball. It was strictly just what are you swinging at? So if we can instill this in them early in our practice plans off the tee, front toss, overhand toss, BP, any machine drills, really hone in on that focus of our approach, we're going to be ready in the games to be more successful. Ronnie, go ahead and take it away, man. Yeah, so most of the stuff that we do, obviously, I've mentioned it before, is a lot of skill work, um, swing development, things like that. But I think that having a really good approach actually masks uh, swing flaws um, for a long time, actually. I know, I mean, even with me, I was, I was constantly working on my swing. Having a good approach actually can mask some of, the, mask some of those issues. But having a perfect swing doesn't, make, doesn't say that you're going to get a hit. Um, if you have a bad approach, but you have the perfect swing, you're not going to be really that successful, I don't think, either. So I think having a really good approach ultimately will supersede mechanics. I think mechanics do play a role to some extent, um, but I think having a good approach is, is number one for sure. Um, but going, going into the game stuff, I think as coaches and as parents, we got to stay away from mechanical cues in game. We have to stay away from it. Um, that, that takes the focus away from team. That's th that takes the focus away from situation and it puts it into you know, just strictly talking about that individual player. Like, oh, the reason why you flew out was because you dropped your shoulder. Okay, let's talk about that in practice. But for the game, let's talk about executing our situations that we're in. And yeah. I want to go into approach. And I said this in the last session, I'll say it now is um, a lot of times approach is based on situation. I know this will lead into a different conversation a little bit, but 
approach is based on situation. So in practice, we have to do a really good job in the cages of making sure that we're focusing on maybe some inside rounds, maybe some outside rounds, situational focus stuff, because we want to put our, our athletes in the best situation for success when we get outside. For instance, I'm a left-handed hitter. If the runner's on second base with no outs, I like the outside pitch naturally. If I was swinging it and nobody on base in a 2 3 one count, I'm looking for something middle of the way that I can drive in the opposite field gap. That's my approach. But with a runner on second base and no outs, I have to be more of a pull type guy, look something middle fat over the plate or inside that I can actually pull in a right center gap because I'm trying to get the runner over to third base. So we can't just go at the hitters like strengths always. I think that we have to talk a lot about situations with them. You know, we'll talk about situations a little more as we go, but you know, runners in scoring position or runner on second base with no outs. I think that that helps us with moving guys into different understanding how to hit the ball opposite field, how to pull it. And that'll actually help their mechanics, if you want to call it that, a lot, because they're going to learn how to spray the ball over the field, which is really what, what people go into mechanics for anyway, is learning to be a more complete hitter. But I think if we do it situationally, it makes it easier for them. When we're not focusing on back shoulder, front shoulder coming out, hip drive. It puts a lot more focus on how can I help my team. So that's really what we focus on a lot in our places, is understanding how to be a better hitter in game, right? So I think that'll be, that's big for everybody. Yeah, Ronnie, I like that you mentioned the team approach. At the end of the day, this is the team version. In the, in the athlete version, we talk more about the individual approach. What are we looking for? Uh, what's going to help us be successful? But then the team approach, if you get athletes to buy into the team approach, we're going to be successful. I know that there's, there's a lot of really good offensive teams across the country, and the ones who do the best job are the ones that buy into the team approach. And you're always going to have that athlete who's like, yeah, I don't really care about that. That's not my philosophy. My philosophy – here's an example. University of San Diego, there's this Matt, this dude who's like 6'7". He's got all the tools and talents in the world. The dude's got it all. But he didn't want to buy into the team approach. I was down there, not this last fall, but the one before, and I'm watching this in the cage. I'm watching him hit. Everybody else, line drives in the middle. Hey, let's focus on line drives in the middle of the field. Line drives in the middle of the field. Simplify the game. We, there's too much going on up here. Let's simplify it. This dude's in here trying to dip rip, drive it to the top cage, focus on high finish, like all these mechanical things that totally got in his mind. And what do you know? The dude's hitting like 050 in the fall. And he's got he's the highly the most the highest recruited athlete that they had, had the best high school statistics, but he tried to change his swing because the Twitter swing coach told him to, hey, take your PVC pipe and go straight up to the sky with it. And this is my swing. Well, guess what? It looks great. And in BP, it looks awesome hitting balls 700 feet. But in the game, how am I going to be successful? I can't go in the game swinging at everything. I'm also not going to be successful if I don't buy into my team approach. Yeah, I might have some success initially, but guess what? Over a long period of time, if I'm not bought into the team philosophy, I'm not going to be very successful. And as a team, we can go much further when people are bought in to team at-bats. And we can get into the quality at-bats here in a minute. But I want to talk approach in different scenarios. So here's the one hey, that hey, I Austin. love. Cause we, hey, Austin, yeah. let, me, yeah. let me jump in here real quick about something. Because yeah. I know we got some younger coaches on here. And, Ronnie, I'd like to get your, your – uh, perspective on this one thing that I've found and I, Sean you kind of touched on something in here about um, how to you know what your uh, philosophy for the younger kids what we have to remember at the younger and I think it's even up to 14 is these kids aren't strong they're not strong enough to hold the bat so one thing that I've learned um, in when I'm coaching them and staying at third base is I would tell them hey tighten up that top hand because what we were getting was the dip of the bat right because when they would come here and that bat would drop it down here and that would cause that pop up but when we said, hey, just tighten up that top hand, and when I would tell them, squeeze it a little bit tighter, and I would show them that stuff, then when they went to drive, what would happen? Now they were focused on that, tight, that top hand being tight, so now they're staying level, and they're getting this good balance here with their hands. So I think that even applies to 13 or 14 because we get into the, you know, the 32 uh, drop three now, right? You got the drop five, you got that type of thing. But I'm just kind of curious, like, <clears throat> how is it on the West Coast and East Coast with these kids that are jumping from uh, um, 12 years old to 14 to 15, do they go from, you know, a 13-year kid, do they, are they right into a drop three? And how are you guys teaching them to kind of keep their hands in that same position? Or is it still a technique thing? Because I think at that age, we're, we're starting to make the transition into the team approach of, you know, make sure you're, you're pushing when you need to push, pull when you need to, need to pull, right? And, and hitting the gaps, that type of thing. But early on, what I'm trying to set up for you guys at the high school level is, you know, getting that hand in the right position and the top hand tight. So 
How do you guys work that on the West Coast, East Coast? I mean, do you guys jump straight from a drop eight into a drop three? Or is there a transition period? So I'll, I'll jump on that. Um, so what I, what I talk to a lot of the parents about, and, I, and I, I say to them every time, is I don't know what you can afford, obviously, financially, but it seems like people are buying bats every single year. So when I tell kids at nine years old, I really don't care what you swing. Figure out a way to feel comfortable. But, you know, I, I kind of go from 13U. In, in our area, 13U, it's 60-90. It's so I know there's some places that's 5480, but we're 6090 for our diamonds. So it's drop three. So I say at 12U, ideally, if we have the right player, I want to go drop five. At 11U, ideally, I'd like to go drop eight. And then at 10U, I can be a drop 10. I'd like to have an incremental growth with them just to get them closer to the drop three. But I will say this, and I, I highly, highly, highly recommend all offseason training is done with wood. The reason why is because it, it's going to teach you how to become a good hitter. All of our guys that are 13 years old and older – are required to swing wood bat in our cages all off season. I'll give it to them. I, I, I'll give you a wood bat if you can't afford it. And the reason why is because I think that that ultimately teaches the swing, right? So I don't even have to talk mechanics. If your hands hurt when you're swinging a wood bat, you're probably not swinging it right. So it'll make it easier. Um, but as for the cues that you were talking about, about stronger top hand, things like that, uh, like I said, we're a lot of skill stuff. But what I talk about a lot with our guys is I, I take the eyes and we focus a lot on the baseball. So, for instance, if a kid is if, – if he keeps hitting the top of the cage, top of the cage, top of the cage, my question to him is, what part of the baseball are you hitting consistently? Oh, you're getting under it a little bit? Okay, perfect. What would make you hit more of a line drive to the back of the cage? And their thought process is, maybe I just have to keep my hands up and hit more of the middle part of the baseball. And I think that visually doing that will fix a lot of the mechanics instead of saying, hey, you're dipping everything. That needs to stay stronger. I think if they can learn how to take their eyes – to the baseball that'll help them a lot with being more consistent and everything that we do is middle of the cage so in the cage when we're hitting i really don't focus a lot on left side right side top bottom i'm more of how many times can we hit the back of the cage in your session and if you don't let's assess it right now so it doesn't become habit so if you ground out to shortstop perfect you hit the outside part of the baseball we know that everybody does what do we have to do to hit more of a line drive okay you're telling me that we have to stay inside of it more so that's going to be our main focus Right. So for us, it's more about visual and that makes it easier because then we're not confusing them with the mechanics, but that's what we do with the younger guys. So that's just a little bit of a recap of how we kind of do things on the East coast here. That's a great point. Ryan. That's, that's an awesome point. I know on the West coast, I think it changes. Uh, I think in Arizona, it's the 60 nineties. And I think they go into the drop threes, but I know Jeannie mentioned um, that they go uh, at least with Nakona over in Wairika, California, up in Northern California, they were swinging a drop five. So it's just that transition. I like the idea though, Ronnie, of going from like an eight to a five to a three, just so they transition into it. But the wood bat's essential. I'm going to second that because if you can learn how to control a wood bat, you're going to be more successful. You're going to be a better hitter overall. So I think that's huge. I mean, like Tom said in there for NorCal, um, a lot of them play with fives or eights, the drop fives or eights. I think no matter what they're swinging, a couple of cues, Ron, you mentioned the eyes. Like something that stuck with me was fix your eyes, fix your swing. Yep. Fix your eyes, fix your swing. Very simple, very easy. And it gets them to really focus those eyes on the baseball. And to do that, we can do colored baseballs. We can do the balls on the plate. Um, anything that's just going to simplify that for us. And then another thing, if we're going top hand, if that top hand is really, really weak, I just tell them to punch me. If I'm throwing BP or punch the pitcher in the face, punch your brother in the face, punch your sister, but maybe not too hard. <laughs> but like whoever's <laughs> taking your cookies, like little bro came in and took my cookies or my PlayStation, I'm going to punch him in the face, right? It gets them to think about, boom, driving that top hand, being strong with it. So they're not necessarily thinking so much mechanics, but they're thinking more doing damage. Um, and hopefully that can do it. And then sometimes, George, I think – they're just weaker. They haven't grown into their bodies and maybe that's just going to be a, a product of that. And we'll just have to work on that as we go. And, and there's not as much that we can do, but those are just some of the cues that I like enjoying. And I know a lot of people have some good cues. So if you have good cues that you use, throw them in the chatter or feel free to speak up and, and blast it out. Cause we can all learn from that. The mental cues are massive to help us get going. Um, if, if there's nothing else, let's get into the approaches, like different times, like let's go bases runners on base. Like what are we teaching our hitters with runners on base? My, my end of things, at least being in more offensive type driven programs and really being a fan of the offense and driving in RBIs, I think when we get on base, when we have runners on base, let's drive in the runs. 
I don't care about moving a guy over. I don't care about trying to be situational. Obviously in high school, maybe it's a little different. We might have to play the game a little more, lay down a bunt, but at least in our league in high school, one, nobody bunted. I think our coach said there was one bunt in like the three years that he was there, which is just weird to me, but I didn't see a bunt in three games. And I was like, all right, this is odd. Like none in the fall either, none in the travel tournaments. It was really weird. But two, like, let's be in a good position to, to hit with runners and scorers. Let's be ready to drive the ball. Like, let's be ready to drive the ball to the outfield, get some runs in. I know Johnny Gomes, when he was with us with the deep backs, mentioned, hey, let's just get a hit. What are you doing running on third base less than two? I said, I'm trying to drive the ball to the outfield, hit a fly ball to center field. He's like, no, you're not. He's like, just try and get a hit. Like, I guess that's one way to look at it, right? There's no cookie cutter way to do it. But if you're trying to drive the ball with runners in scoring position, that's the whole key. Let's not switch our approach around. Let's still hunt our pitches because that's going to give us the best chance to succeed with runners in scoring position. But let's have a plan. Let's have an approach as a team, our philosophy. Let's drive in runs. Let's not like, let's capitalize when we have runners on base. What would you say to that, Jake? Kind of what you're doing with your program and some different things that have worked, maybe terminology-wise. Yep. No, I totally agree. I think um, teaching situational hitting is super important. And there's times to adjust our approach based on the game situation. But I think one key to make sure that hitters understand is if we have runners on second and third and nobody out and I'm coming up to the plate, I don't want to adjust my pro my approach to just ground out and drive in the run until I have two strikes. Right. So we don't want to give up our entire at bat just because of a situation. Now, if we fall down in the count, Oh, two, one, two, now we got to pound our chest and go to battle, right? We go to work to drive in that run. But if I'm sitting 2-0, thinking about hitting a ground ball up the middle, okay, I have the wrong approach. I'm trying to do damage. I'm trying to hit a double and drive in both the runs. So although we want to talk approach, we want to adjust to situations. We need to make sure we're not giving up entire at-bats just to do that um, because big innings matter, right? There's been a lot of stats about – um, teams that win based on amount of big innings that they have in a game. So a big inning being three or more runs. So if we have that opportunity, that could be the difference in a big inning or just pushing one across that's easier for them to get back. So uh, make sure that we're, we're talking the right way there. Um, I think one thing that, that maybe we'll get into a little bit here that we didn't with players too is just developing a lineup, right? Like you have the ability to develop a lineup and put a batting order together that fits your style. And some people think that there's like a perfect lineup. Um, maybe that's coach's kid in the three hole. Who knows? Who knows? I know that that's probably what it is for George. Right. But, um, <laughs> but, but there are, there you go. But there are some key things. Um, and some of that depends on what you value as a team. Like for me, we run a lot of bases, right? We're, we're very vocal and open about that. And every team we know, or every team we play knows going in that we're going to steal. So, I want my leadoff hitter to be an on-base guy, but I also need my leadoff hitter to be a guy that can get himself a second, right? I'm not wasting my two hole to get a bunt down. I'm stealing the bag. So for me, that means in the two hole, I want a lefty, right? And I want it to be my best left-handed hitter, <laughs> ideally, because now if we get a guy on first, middle infielders pinch, right? So that whole side of the infield's wide open. And on a single there, I can go first to third with somebody fast, whereas if a, a righty pulls it, I'm stopping at second. Okay, so that gives me a two-hole hitter where we can advance multiple bases. Okay, ideally your three-hole is your best hitter. Um, I like that as the two-hole as well when you're batting nine um, or ten because they're going to get a few more at-bats throughout the game. So if my best hitter is a lefty, he's going to be in the two-hole. Okay, best right-handed hitter typically in the three-hole. And then you have a ton of opportunity to kind of pick and choose what you want. Um, like I don't mind a four hole with a high strikeout rate if he does damage, but I need my five hole hitter for me to be another lead off because when the four hole strikes out, now this guy's got a job to do to drive in that run. Okay. So I don't really care about power in the five. Um, I want my nine to be another lead off guy to roll to the top. So that way my best hitter in the two becomes a three, right? So you have a lot of opportunity to do it. Um, I know some teams like follow a certain stat line to figure those things out. Um, you know, quality at bats matter. I wouldn't look specifically at average to figure those things out, but I will say that when you do that, um, you know, not that you can't make any changes, but most baseball players are routine guys. So I always wanted to show up knowing where I was going to hit that day. Um, so I wanted some type of consistency. So I'd recommend if you make a change, um, it goes a long way to tell the player before they see it on the lineup. Like, hey, man, we have a, a catcher. This, this is another great option for you guys in travel. 
we have a catcher who's our best on base guy. Not a great base runner, and he's slow. But travel, you get to courtesy run for your catcher at any point in time. So he's our leadoff. And then we have a guy on the bench who's fast. We'll put him in. And now our catcher is based on the two parts that he's playing. Right now he's a great leadoff because we can run for him. So you have some options to think outside the box. But I think when you look at your team, what do you do well? How are you going to approach situations? Do you need to bunt to score? There are some teams that you need to do that to score runs. That's fine. Um, but when you start to figure out how to actually put together that lineup, that can make a difference in a couple of runs per game that you're looking at too. So I think the situations and the order play a big role for sure. Yeah. Go ahead. And, um, right, and, and to go off, Jake said about putting guys in certain spots based on what your needs are as a strategy or what you think their strengths are. Um, like he talked about putting a guy in the four hole that is, he expects to do damage, but may strike out a little bit more. Make sure that when you are building these lineups and Jeannie said it right here as well, nine spots is a second lead off. Like there's a lot of kids that just look at a lineup and they see those numbers and they think what number in their, they're at defines <laughs> your mind as a coach, what kind of hitter you they, whether or not they're good or whether or not they're bad. If they're not one through four, you must think that they're bad. Like, let them know that why you have them in certain spots. Like, we've had four hole hitters that we've put in there before that we put in there in that situation because we want them to do damage, and then they'll come up with some RBI spots, and they'll just be a little bit more selective than what we want. Make sure you're communicating to your hitters that, like, hey, it's okay for you to expand your zone here because we think that you can barrel it up more than maybe some other hitters can. A strikeout here for you is not going to make us that upset if you're expanding your zone and trying to do damage. So as you're building those lineups, let the bat, the hitters know why they're there, whether what your, whatever your criteria is, whether it's off of quality of bats, average, whatever, right? And then what the strategy is for your game plan um, with them in that spot. That way they know going into it the, the mentality that they need to have at the plate. Because just I've seen that from uh, playing, you know, other teams and then coaching teams where we've had people in certain spots because we can expect them to do that job. But we need to also communicate that to them so they go into the game with that philosophy and that mindset of that bat. Yeah. One other thing before we pass it to Ronnie that we did one year, and I would highly recommend it in travel, um, if you have a lineup that you trust, if you put a guy in the one hole, it's a good contact person, but somebody that's got some pop, you can come out and just punch a lot of teams in the mouth to start the game. And it's a great feeling for your team. And most teams hate that. I mean, think about it. The pitcher throws the first pitch of the game and they're down one to nothing. It's not a great feeling. So, um, you know, we had a hitter, he was a lefty. He was an incredible player, um, high average guy, but also high power. So, Rather than putting him in the three when outfielders are going to move back, we let him play shallow and let this guy lead off and just bomb everybody early in the game. Uh, and it really became like a mentality of the team of like, hey, watch this. Look where they're playing. This is going to be fun. Um, and it just started the game off with some confidence. So you can be a little unconventional in how you do it as long as you have a plan and an approach as to why you're doing it. Yeah. Um, Ronnie, before you, before you hop in there, dude, I just wanted to throw a random statistic I put in the chat. As of at least five years ago, and I don't, this could maybe hold true still, but there's the, the two-hole hitter came up to the plate with more RBI opportunities than the three, four, and five hitter. Yep. And mind you, you talk about being unconventional. Our coach wanted to, to at the pro level, was like, hey, you're going to hit two, and this other guy's going to hit one because we want you to, one, have more at-bats in the game, two, come up with more RBI situations. Well, after yep. the first game, it got banged by upper management because they called in, why are you hitting him in the two-hole? He's only the four-hole or three-hole. It's the only spot you're going to hit this guy. Well, guess what? By statistics go, like over the last 20, 30, 40 years, the two-hole hitter gets more RBI opportunities. So you think about it, like some people may be like, you're crazy. Why would you hit your big bopper one or two? Well, guess what? I want – him or her to get one the most at bats to give me the best chance to turn my lineup over more often. So I think that's going to, that's massive. And it's just the unconventional thought is huge. If you do think about that, um, don't be afraid to do it. If, if you have been, and, and you don't have to go with the traditional three, four, five, because I don't want my best hitter hitting four or five because that takes forever to get to. I want him in the first, like first inning, no matter what we can set the tone early. Maybe it's three hole, maybe it's two, maybe it's one, but I want them hitting early and often more consistently because I know it's going to put more pressure on that pitcher to make good pitches early, which hopefully helps the guys behind them. Ronnie, go ahead. Yeah, so so just going off my experience playing in college, I, I think that having conversations consistently with your players is huge. So my coach sat me down 
I was a leadoff guy, more of a leadoff guy, like top of the kind of order in high school. And when I got to college, he basically said, I need you in the lineup, but the problem is, is I can't put you in a position that you want to be in. You're going to bat ninth, and you're probably going to stay there for the next three years. And he said, and here's why. He's like, you're just not fast enough to lead off. He was like, you just don't hit the ball far enough to bat third or fourth, but you're getting on base like almost 40% of the time. So I need you in the lineup, but I want you to understand that you're actually just as valuable as everybody else on the team. It was so easy for me to buy in. And then we had a guy who, who got, he got drafted in the ninth round, but he was our leadoff guy. And he was, he was power guys. Same thing that Austin talked about or Jake talked about where you put a big bopper early and I was on first, whether I got hit by a pitch, walked or, or snuck a single in there, whatever, and then come up and the double scores me. And before you know it, we're in the middle innings of the game and we're just piling runs on because we got guys in the first four or five guys in our lineup that are getting hit. So it was easy for me to buy in because the conversation that he had with me made me feel like the nine hole, which I thought growing up was like the worst hitter on the team. It made me feel like it was very valuable. And I think that we – we have to be vulnerable as coaches to have those conversations and, and to understand that some guys are going to be like, Hey, I don't think that's for me, but okay. But that's what the team needs. And I think that having that conversation with them is extremely important. It changed my career for sure. Um, and I, I know that it's, it changes a lot of kids that even I talk to like, Hey, who are you as a hitter? Understand who you are as a hitter. I know that you want to hit home runs. I always wanted to hit 25 home runs a year. It just wasn't who I was. So I had to figure out who I was as a hitter and then buy into that. I think that conversations changed that for me, though, which I think is big. Well, and Ronnie, you touched on something important of having those conversations because Ben mentioned it in the chat, too, um, and it's awesome. Like this idea, we, we have some hitters that might hit 340 in the eight hole, but we're not going to move them from the eight hole, right? If they can only hit fastballs, we're going to put them in a spot in the order where they can handle their pitch sequencing. So – a lot of times parents get upset about that because they see average climb. So they think that spot in the order should climb as well. So make sure you're communicating with the player like, hey, we all know you're struggling to see a curveball, but you are killing fastballs. We're going to put you in this spot where you're going to get that pitch. Okay, one easy way to do that. Um, we like to put our guys that have a lot of power but only hit fastballs well directly behind our fast guys. That way, fast guy gets on. Okay, pitcher's not going to throw a bunch of junk because they know we're going to take the back. So now we've put the pitcher in a predicament of, hey, I'm either going to throw a breaking ball and give up second base on a steal, or I'm going to challenge this guy with a fastball and focus more on the base runner where now as a hitter, I have the opportunity to drive the ball. Okay, So you can sequence the hitters in a way that just puts a lot of pressure on the defense. But I think understanding what your hitters can handle as far as sequencing and as far as pressure situations um, is important when you're putting that lineup together, for sure. Those are great points. If I can piggyback off that just for one second. Um, I remember, even for me, I know Austin talks a lot about how he wants to hunt fastballs that are middle of the way. But from what I – I mean, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but I feel like Austin was more of a middle, middle of the order kind of guy. That probably means that you saw breaking balls pretty well. For me, on the other hand, I struggle with change-ups, and that's what put me down lower in the order. But my coach had that conversation with, hey, you're a really good fastball hitter, and I know that you're going to pound – away fastballs in the gap away. But I also know that you're going to struggle with breaking balls and changeups. So I want you to see more fastballs. And I know our leadoff guys are probably going to see more breaking balls and changeups. So I want to put you in a position for success. Yep. That was where I was like, bingo. So I'm going to yep. see, I'm going to see 85% fastballs and I'm hitting ninth. Okay. So it doesn't matter because I'm still going to be a good hitter. Yep. You know, and I, and I think that if he would have batted me lead off, maybe I would have felt better in the short term. But in the long term, when I'm batting, you know, 190 or 200, I'm probably not feeling so great about batting leadoff anymore. So I think that that's where we can get a lot of our hitters to go in there. Maybe there is a power guy that needs to see more fastballs that we can't bat fourth or fifth because he can't hit the breaking ball. Yep. Right. So you put him in the six, seven, eight range where he's going to see more fastballs. Now you're getting the most out of that guy. Yep. I think that's how you can set your lineup for sure. 100%. I love – this is fires me up. I love talking. <laughs> it's like you can be so strategic and you can do different things. Like – you can let me try this let me try that like be creative with there's no cookie cutter way to do it we don't have to do it like boom 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 by the book like if you want to hit your pitcher yeah, yeah. if you're in in pro ball you want to hit your pitcher six do it maybe not recommend it but try it like whatever is going to get your guys going a lot of people will change up their lineups every single day i don't recommend that because as a as a player just speaking from an athletic stand like an athlete standpoint it's really confusing to never know where you're going to hit it sucks going to a game one day you're three next day you're five next day you're one next day you're seven and you're sitting there like what the heck I went two for four so now that night you're thinking oh maybe I'll move up in the lineup 
I went over four. Crap, I'm going to move down the lineup. And that's like the worst thing that could happen. So if you're going to have a lineup, like set it clear um, and be clear with them. But number two, like the clear communication. This is, came up all last week and this week as well. And a lot of us in here, we do it really well. The coaches that are in here already, but continue to do it. Like just be clear with them on why. Like, why are we doing this? What is the reason behind this? And let's keep doing this. But we got a couple of minutes left. Let's touch on two strikes. Real before. quick, I roll off of that. Yeah. Real quick, yeah, yeah. Austin. Absolutely, Ben. Um, one, one thing about the, the lineup is that, uh, you know, we like to remind guys that the, the game of baseball is the best is because it's like a game of roulette. You never know what A, B, what spot in the lineup is going to yep. win the game. Yep. So if, if they all know that, then it, it doesn't matter what spot you're in. You're, you're going to have a chance and opportunity to win the game. So take advantage of it. You know, whereas like in a basketball game, you can you can draw a play for the best player to win a game. You know, so you know the the lineup thing is 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 sometimes you know it's tough to deal with as a coach. But reminding them that of saying, hey, the game of baseball doesn't matter, man. It's a game of roulette. So we don't know what AB is going to win the game. So everybody needs to be ready, one through nine. Well, then at yep. the college level, Ben, because he's been Ben's coaching at Santa Rosa Community College. What, like, how do you get that across to your athletes? Then, like, how do you communicate that to them? Is it just like, hey, it's a game of roulette, or is there like a, a certain thing when athletes come to you? I'm sure they come to you over the head coach and they're like, coach, I don't like, why am I hitting nine? Why am I hitting yeah. eight? I mean, sometimes, you know, we were, we're fortunate because we, I think we do a good part of developing the man and having them kind of understand things and think. A lot of them understand, you know, I mean, the eight, nine guys, I think they, I think they know, you know, like, Hey, we're in here because maybe of a defensive thing or, or whatever, but you know, sometimes you get those guys, you know, especially like the six, seven, the kind of think they should be batting higher or whatever. Um, you, you just remind them, man, it don't matter. Just go up there and bang the ball around, man. Let's just let's win ball game. That's what this is about. So it doesn't matter what spot you're in. Um, you know, it, it, it really doesn't matter because it's game of roulette. So it's only the, you know, I, like I, I've told guys before, you know, they start hearing them kind of whine or, you know, you hear conversations with other players and you just say, hey, man, it's, it's the, the lineup's never one through nine unless you bat one through nine in the first inning. After that, you're going to have your two hitter is your whoever's batting second that inning. Like, the, you know, your leadoff, who's ever batting leadoff that inning. So everybody's got a job to do. And you just kind of remind them, just go up there and do your job. That's, that's your job. A runner's on third, no outs. Your job is to get that run in. Like, I don't care if you're the nine-hole hitter, three-hole hitter, or, or leadoff hitter. Like, everybody's got a job to do, so get it done. I really like that, Ben. I really – I like the idea of not having a label on it. As I'm yeah. the six-hitter, I'm the three-hitter. And I think it you know, is. When, when it comes down to I mean, the, the leadoff, you, you like to make a statement, first AB of the game. Um, your three-hole hitter, somebody who can handle a curveball because of pitch sequencing, what you guys talked about. Same with a four. Um, maybe you want a five, somebody who's who's got, you know, who's, who can help hit behind your three or four, you know, stuff like that. A two-hole hitter, like someone mentioned before, you want you want him who's going to come up later in the game, you know. Who, who do I want to potentially be up in the eighth, ninth with the game-winning run on or, or to try to get on to be the game-winning run because of that extra bat to roll over. So it, it, it's all – it's an interesting, it's an interesting juggle, but it, that's the fun part, right? As coaches. Yep. And it won't work every time. If it did, no. this wouldn't be fun. That's yeah. the thing. Like you have to take those risks. And I think, and this is the first time I'm realizing this from listening to everybody else too, but I think what we're all trying to say is like order doesn't matter quite as much as proximity between hitters, right? If you have a strikeout guy, you want to make sure that you follow that up. He's protected by a contact guy in case he fails in getting the job done. You don't mm -hmm. want to hinder a fast runner by putting him directly behind a slower guy to where you take away part of his game to be able to steal bags. So as much as like order itself might not be as important, right? It's going to change throughout the game. Proximity of hitters is a constant that never changes. So you want to make sure that you place them according to make sure that they can maximize their strengths. Absolutely. And hitting behind certain guys too. Like if you know yes. this guy's getting on quite a bit and he's, getting in scoring position quite a bit, and the guy at the, who keeps hitting behind him can't handle that, then right. you need to flip-flop him with the guy or something. And it's yep. like, okay, he's still batting 350, but, man, he can't handle the four, so let's make him a five or a six, you know. Yep. It, it's, it's just you, – it, and, you know, and that will dictate throughout the season and, and you recognizing the situations. Yep. 
This is I'm Later. learning a lot. <laughs> Mic drop. I'm done. I'm out. Later. Guys. <laughs> um, this is awesome. It's awesome to just hear different perspectives from all different levels. We've heard perspectives from a youth level. We've heard perspectives from high school, from the college level, from the professional level. Like, there's a lot of similarities though, and I think that's get creative with it and empower your hitters empower your team to, to go after it and find their approach that works for them. If we can have a collective group of athletes who are bought in not only to the team philosophy, but to the philosophy that works for them, it's going to help set them up for success and be the most confident. We mentioned confidence a lot. Like if we can get our athletes to be as confident as possible, going up to the dish, trusting in each other and trusting in us, we're going to have success offensively. And that's the best part is we don't need to be the most talented offensive team to drive in a lot of runs. If we're bought into our philosophy, if we're bought into what we do well, we're going to drive in and manufacture runs very, very well. We run the bases hard. We'll get into that later on this week. We're going to battle with two strikes. We weren't able to get into that today, but we can touch on it briefly tomorrow um, when we open up. But which is just getting athletes to buy in, man. That, that's the key. And then they buy into you and your approach. But I think it all starts in practice. The way you practice, the way you play. But if we just go up there swinging at everything and, and we don't hold the athletes accountable in the cages to be doing that due diligence in their work, it translates directly to the game. You'll see that a lot with young hitters, especially who they go into the box and they're swinging at everything. You see it in, in professional baseball with Dominicans who go in there and they swing at everything because they can hit everything. They're, they're an incredible athlete. But in the game, 94 was sink bought down and away in the other batter's box. It doesn't play well. In the cage, it looks great on the yeah. front toss. But in the game, it's not going to work well. So finding stuff that works for us, having a, a, a specific approach, in a plan with intent. You talk a lot, Jake, about that intent, like having an intent behind our actions, whatever that may be, whatever philosophy works for us is key. You guys have anything else to add? We got like two or three minutes. The, the one thing that I'll add, um, and I mentioned it to players, but with so many youth coaches, one thing that's talked about a lot right now, it's a hot topic in baseball is strikeouts, right? Because major league baseball, they've kind of gone the route of hit it, hit it far, hit it big, but they don't really care about strikeouts. Um, I would encourage you to shy away from that approach at the youth level, right? Because at the pro level, most of those, those players, when they get a ground ball or they get a fly ball, they're going to make the play, right? Their fielding percentage is extremely high. When we talk the high school or the youth level, um, fielding percentages drop. So every time that you make the baseball exchange hands, you're giving an opportunity for them to, to have an error, make a mistake, right? So we want them to have to pick off as many times as possible. We want to put the ball in place so they have to feel it and throw it and catch it as many times as possible. Um, we can't do anything except create pressure and put the ball in play to force them to make errors. But if we increase the number of times that they have to throw it and catch it, if their percentage stays the same, they'll still make more errors um, from the quantitative standpoint just by increasing chances. So our job, especially with two strikes, is to develop, to develop an approach and make sure players are comfortable hitting there. Um, over 50% of at-bats get to two strikes. So they're going to spend a lot of time hitting with two strikes, um, which gives two options. One, if you have hitters that struggle with it, adapt an approach that makes them more aggressive early in the count so they never have to get there. Okay, so maybe that helps their comfort level. Um, but I would highly recommend teaching hitting backwards when you're talking approach and start with two strikes, get them comfortable there because when they're more comfortable hitting with two strikes, then that gives them the freedom to really let it fly and let it loose when they're in a hitter's count because they're not afraid of what happens if they miss. All right. So that would be my, my last take there is, you know, contact is key at the youth level. You can create a lot of pressure with it. I love it. Put pressure on the defense. Never go wrong with that, right? Never go wrong with that, no matter how old we are. So that's that's good. It's great stuff, man. This was good. And we'll get into some of this more tomorrow and, and continue this throughout the week, every day, 2 o'clock Pacific time. So um, let's keep it rolling. Thank you guys again for showing up for week two. Yes. Really have no clue what's going to happen, who's going to show up, who's not. We just send it out and hope that people want to come. And, and it's been cool to get some really good feedback. So keep encouraging each other. Keep encouraging your athletes that you have and inspiring them during this time. As we know, it's, it's different. And um, hoping for some good news in the next couple of weeks so we can get out on that field and do what we love to do. We can Absolutely. talk about it all we want, but now we can put it into action and get rolling. So um, appreciate you guys. We'll be back here again 2 p.m. Um, this will be up on YouTube. Too. All these will be on YouTube. So if you miss a day or if you're gone for a week or you want to send your assistant coach or somebody who needs it or wants it, send it over. Even if you want to send it to a parent to just get some more education on it, that's fine too. Feel free to do that. Um, and this will be the link now for the next three weeks. So feel free to forward this, out, this one out if anybody missed it. Yep. Perfect. Have a good day, guys.
Take care. Take care. Thank you.